I'm thankful for uh, our men here who uh, come alongside this pastor and just is such an encouragement. Amen. Good, good teaching. If you if you think you did, if you don't know what you missed, you need to. Uh, you can see that on on YouTube. It was recorded, and uh, you can also get the CD. Uh, he's a lot better looking on the CD than he is on YouTube, <laughs> but that's okay. Amen. I'll tell you what, we're just not here today. Thank you, brothers. I appreciate that. Can I just also tell you this? Uh, when, when, when you encourage your your youth pastor and everybody that's uh, serving here, you're a blessing. Amen. And uh, I was just blessed this morning with the, with the Amen. teaching this morning. Amen. Amen. I would invite you to turn in your Bibles this morning to Second Timothy. Second Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1, and notice with me verse 9, 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning with actually verse 5, verse 5, verse 5, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and in thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also, where, by the way, isn't that good? Amen. And right there, there's a message that can be preached all day long about family and seeing ministry take place from generation to generation. Amen. Amen. Notice verse 6. Verse 6. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. Be, notice verse 8, be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and peace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Father, we do thank you for this morning, as we have already enjoyed so much of what it means to worship you, to magnify you, to glorify you. We've done that in the teaching and preaching that has taken place in this place, in the singing and the praising that has taken place, in the stirring of the baptismal waters that has taken place. Lord, our, our, we're filled and we're thankful. And now we're ready and willing to receive what you have for each and every one of us, Lord. Speak to hearts. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. And amen. You know, these are some of my favorite verses, and you know me. My favorite verses are the ones that I just read. That's always the case. You know these folks who, who uh, sign Bibles, and they'll sign their name, and they'll put a verse? You know, I, I stick with Jude 23, because I don't have to write as much as everybody else, number one. And number two, that's a really good verse. But if I really told you the truth... It's whatever I just read last that I'd like to write down. It's whatever I've studied most recently. Do you feel that way? Are you that way when it gets in when it gets to getting into the Word of God? These verses are familiar to many of us, but every single time I read these scriptures, I gotta tell you, I just there's a jolt that goes through my body. I get excited about that. And as uh, Pastor Ashley said in Sunday school, we ought to get excited about some things. Do you think we can get excited about? Uh, our football teams and our baseball teams and basketball teams, why can't we get excited about what God is doing? Amen? Amen. 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 Over the last several weeks, as a matter of fact, really, uh, a major theme for this year has been grace. And over uh, the last many weeks, we've been, we've been preaching on, teaching on, speaking on grace. As a matter of fact, I don't really think you can separate grace from any preaching or teaching that takes place. If you're preaching the Bible, if you're preaching the Word of God, we are resurrected Christians today. We are thankful for our salvation today. We are men and women who understand, who need to understand what it, mean, what it means to have a reassuring grace. A reassuring
reassuring grace. And that's what I want to do this morning. I want to reassure you and I, beginning with myself, that the grace that we have, the grace for the pace, is a reassuring grace. You know, common in the first words of the Apostle Paul's message to the uh, in, in, to, to what we just read is grace to you. Don't you like that? Now, I know that's become a proper, popular uh, phrase now. I think there's even one uh, Christian uh, radio program that uses that, that phrase. But more important than anybody's program or, or any familiarity to the phrase itself is what it says. How about that? Can you think of anything more precious to say to someone? I mean, think about how precious that is. You know, we say hello and goodbye in, in, in English, but how about this? Grace to you. Grace to you. You see, the phrase was imparted by the Holy Spirit to every believer. This, this phrase was one that was reminding us that grace is something that you and I can only have, really have, as born-again believers. Timothy had received special grace, in this case, for the ministry at the time that he was uh, set aside for the gospel. That's what the laying on of hands is, is signifying here. There's a recognition and, a, and an understanding that he has been set aside for the gospel ministry. Some people think that, well, there's some kind of magic or electricity in somebody's fingers when they lay hands on someone. And uh, I think that's a little over the top. And I'm glad that that's not the case because that could be dangerous, you know? I mean, how would you like Brother Will come and lay hands on you and all of a sudden you're, you know, you're shaking and convulsing? Well, in some churches that happens. But the truth is some have de-emphasized the ministry and the teaching of laying on of hands and, and don't recognize the significance. Uh, hands were laid on me when I, when I answered the call to uh, preach the gospel. Hands were laid on our deacons when they answered the call to, to be men serving in that capacity. God, uh, God calls us, and, and we recognize God's calling, and there's a laying on of hands, and we see that it's taught here in the Scripture. Notice again, verse 6. Notice verse 6. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of of my hands. And so there's a there's a, a recognition that you're you're specifically focusing on and seeing uh, God moving and there should be a stirring up that takes place. And you know if if you're not stirred up about serving the Lord, you know, maybe you ought to be. You gotta yeah. think about that. You gotta think yeah. about how hey. how precious is it, how important is it yep. that we be excited about the opportunity to serve the Lord hey. in capacity. Yes. I've mentioned this before, but I still go back to the time when I was first given a sixth grade class to teach Sunday Praise school. God. I was petrified, yep. scared to death. I was more afraid than I was uh, than I am of you today. That uh, with, uh, way way back then, and I yeah. thought, what a privilege, what a yes. joy. What a, what a marvelous, marvelous, marvelous privilege it is uh, that somebody would entrust me with their children. And I'll tell you, I was like, You're right, brother. How, how should I put it? Anybody ever hear of a, a message entitled, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God? Yes, sir. Anybody remember the preacher who preached that message? Jonathan, yeah, Jonathan Edwards. Anybody remember hearing about how he preached it? In manuscript form, no emotion whatsoever. He just read his message from top to bottom. People were crying and weeping and 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 just uh, uh, just falling on their faces and asking God for forgiveness because it was the power of the Holy Spirit the whole way. Well, I didn't see all that happen when I taught Sunday school, but I did read my, my Sunday school lesson pretty much the same way Jonathan Edwards did. I just read it from top to bottom because I didn't want to get anything wrong. I didn't want to make any mistakes whatsoever. And you know what? I still, I'm still overwhelmed when I think, what a joy, what a privilege it is to be able to serve the Lord this way. And so when I uh, answered the call to, to preach, to be a preacher of the gospel, I, I remember that special time when we had uh, a laying on of hands and there was a special uh, focus and recognition of this calling. And that's precious. That is so important. But did you know that for every one of us as believers, 
We ought to understand that there ought to be, I love it again, I'll say it again. Let me just read the verse again. There ought to be a stirring up, a stirring up of this gift of God that God has given us. Amen? And so we must be strong in his grace daily. As a matter of fact, if you'll notice uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And so with that said, firstly, we see his grace reassures us with power. His grace reassures us with his power. With power. Notice verse 7. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1. Notice again verse 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. How many are thankful for that? Amen? God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power. But of power and of love and of a sound mind. Focusing on power. You see, this is not the power of humanism or the power of the human spirit or, or man's strength or in any way what man can conjure up. There's a lot of conjuring up these days. There's a lot of emotionalism that is man-centered and not God-centered. I'm not saying you should never get emotional. We've already mentioned that you should get real excited about the things of God. But, you know, I like the way uh, Brother Harrison, uh, the evangelist uh, who uh, preached the camp meeting here a few weeks ago in the valley, he said, when God's in it, it's right. Amen? When God is in it, it is right. And so we need to know that it's about the Holy Spirit of God. Power is from the Holy Spirit. And yes, it's okay to say Holy Ghost. It says it in my Bible. We should be Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, uh, walking in the Spirit Christians. How many would agree with that? You know, in some circles, we've dialed that back. No doubt about it. This word uh, for strength or power is... Uh, is the word dunamis, which is where we get the word dynamite from. How many think that, you know what, there ought to be a little bit of dynamite lit under a few Christians Amen. these days? Amen? So we're talking about power, strength, ability, inherent power, power residing in a thing by virtue of its nature. That's what we're talking about this morning. The Holy Spirit resides in every born-again Christian. In every born-again Christian, it's not something you buy. It's not something that you can even pay for. We see in the scripture where that was tried and it doesn't work. It is not something that you can work for or that you deserve any more than you deserve to be saved. As a matter of fact, notice what the Bible says. John chapter 3 verse 6 says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Romans chapter 8, verse 8. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. How many would agree with that? If you're in the flesh, you cannot please God. Verse 9 says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. And so, you can only, only have the Spirit of God dwelling in you if you're saved. It says, and then the scripture goes on to say, Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So if you don't have the spirit of Christ, I'm going to tell you what the problem is. You're not saved. And if you have trusted Christ as Savior, it is not something that you conjure up. It's not something that you can purchase or buy or something that you can emotionally talk yourself into. This whole business of being baptized in the spirit, it takes place the moment you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Amen? Amen? You are not more of a super Christian than anyone else. What you need to now know is, if, uh, if the Holy Spirit indwells me, I have to now walk in the Spirit. I have to make the cognizant decision. I've got to choose to walk in the Spirit. That means I'm going to make that my mind up that I'm going to do that. And how do you do that? You do exactly what the Bible says. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Anybody know that verse? Anybody? How does that verse go? Let me see if anybody knows that verse. Anybody know that verse? It says, let's look at the verse itself, okay? Let's turn there. Ephesians 5. Be not drunk 